Uterine fibroids are a very common soft tissue tumor of the uterus. If you've been diagnosed with one, or if you're just interested in what they might be, you may have a few questions about uterine fibroids. I'm Dr. Monica, board certified OBGYN and mom of three. And in this video, I wanna to explain to you what uterine fibroids are, what type of symptoms you might have if you have them, and some treatment options and other discussions about uterine fibroids. Uterine fibroids are super common. They occur in about 70% of women. That is a lot of women who have uterine fibroids. Now, not everybody knows that they have them because they aren't always symptomatic. And in fact, only about 25% of fibroids actually require intervention. That number of 70% might not be entirely accurate because so many of them are asymptomatic. There could be some that have never been discovered. So our best guess is that it's 70% of women. But 25% is around the amount that actually require me medical intervention. Now here's the question that I always get. You just told me I have a fibroid tumor. A tumor, does that mean this is cancer? Is this a risk of cancer? And the short answer is no. Uterine fibroids, for the vast majority of them, are not cancerous. There is a form of uterine cancer in the shape and general form of a fibroid called a leiomyosarcoma. This is an extremely rare uterine cancer that could be confused with a fibroid. And when we talk about rare, the most accurate and the biggest study that was done on leiomyosarcomas or cancerous fibroids show that they occur, occur in 0.38 of every 100,000 woman years. What's a woman year? Does anyone really know what a woman year is? I think a little bit of an easier number to give you an idea is that other studies have indicated that of uterine fibroids that are operated on and removed, only one in anywhere from 700 to one in 10,000 will actually be a cancer. Now I can tell you that I have seen leiomyosarcomas in my career, but over 11 years, I've maybe only seen it two or three times. And I've seen tons and tons and tons and tons of fibroids. So just from a little bit of real world experience, they are definitely extremely rare. Now we're gonna get into some of the risks and protective factors for whether or not you'd be likely to form fibroids. But one of the significant life changes that um, will make an effect on fibroids is menopause. Fibroids grow through estrogen and they're activated with the hormones that change in your menstrual cycle, including estrogen and progesterone. And once you go through menopause, your estrogen levels decline significantly and progesterone becomes more stable and also lower. So once menopause hits, fibroids, if they had caused any symptoms before, they tend to become more tolerable or stop causing problems or symptoms once menopause hits. Now let's talk about the different types of fibroids. The location of the fibroid, which changes the name of them, plays a big role in what type of symptoms you might see if you have them. So referencing today's hand-drawn diagram, I have on this uh, little diagram, here an example of where the fibroids can be located and what they are called. So let's first look at these pink fibroids. These fibroids, you can see this is our, our big uterus, this is the inside, and this is the endometrium. These pink fibroids are located on the inside of the uterus within the endometrium, and these are called submucosal fibroids. You can see that this one is partially within the actual wall of the uterus, but does butt out into the cavity of the uterus. And this one is actually kind of hanging off of a little stalk. This is called a pedunculated fibroid. So these submucosal fibroids tend to cause more problems with bleeding because this endometrium is what will shed off and contribute to periods. So if a fibroid is present there, it can cause heavier bleeding. Fibroids tend to sequester blood supply to them so they will have larger blood vessels. And if they are located where the tissue comes off for a period, this can cause some heavier menstrual bleeding. Now let's move out from that type of fibroid to these purple ones here. So you can see these fibroids are located with in the wall of the uterus. These are called intramural fibroids. Now these can do a couple of different things. They might sit in there and cause no problems and be asymptomatic. They might, because they do tend to have more blood supply to them, contribute to some heavier bleeding. And then depending on how big they are, if they get large enough to actually end up pushing outward on the uterus as well, they may cause what's called bulk effect or mass effect, meaning that just the size of them and the pressure on them on surrounding structures can cause symptoms like pressure, pain, and discomfort. Now this last type of fibroid are these blue ones, and these you can see are more towards the outside of the uterus. These are called subserosal fibroids. And you can see that this one is partially within the wall of the uterus, while this one, similar to this guy, is hanging on a little stalk, and he is also called a pedunculated fibroid. So these ones that sit on the outside, they are less likely to cause problems with bleeding because they are just kind of more remote from where all the bleeding activity takes place for a period. They're more likely to 
either be asymptomatic if they're small or if they do get large enough or depending on their exact location, they can push on other structures and cause that bulk or mass effect. Now, this is a general overview of where these fibroids can be. There are actually eight different classifications of these fibroids depending on what amount of them is within the cavity or within the wall, out of the uterus or within the wall, or if they're located elsewhere such as down in the cervix. So there are a lot of different types, but this is the general rundown of where they can be located and those are the symptoms they can cause. So what risk factors might you have that would put you at an increased risk of having uterine fibroids? The first one would be increasing age, but only up until menopause. Like we talked about, once you go through menopause, the risk of having symptomatic fibroids decreases. But in your premenopausal years, as you increase in age, your risk of having uterine fibroids increases. Other risk factors include a known family history of fibroids, obesity, and hypertension. How about some protective factors? If you've had multiple babies, that decreases your risk of having uterine fibroids. If you've taken oral contraceptive pills or used Depo-Provera for birth control, these treatments also decrease the risk that you would have uterine fibroids. So we talked about the symptoms that can be caused by fibroids, which is usually based on their location. So how would they be diagnosed? Let's say you went into your OBGYN and you were complaining of having heavier periods or you were feeling pain in your abdomen. If your clinician then did a pelvic exam and felt like they were feeling something larger, your uterus seemed enlarged or they felt something bulky, they would likely go ahead and order an ultrasound to visualize and image the organs of the pelvis to see if anything's there. Alternatively, even if you weren't having symptoms, but during your routine exam, your clinician noticed an abnormality with your uterus or the pelvic organs, then an ultrasound might be ordered and that would be a way to look at these organs and see if there's anything there. So ultrasound is a way to determine if fibroids are there. A lot of times what I'll notice is that I order an ultrasound because we order them all the time and it might be for something that I wasn't really necessarily suspicious of fibroids. So maybe kind of, you know, always had heavier periods or maybe a little bit of pain. And, you know, we're not exactly sure what's going on, but through that ultrasound, fibroids were discovered. I also sometimes see patients who went to the emergency room for unrelated issues and had a CT scan, which happened to look at the abdomen and pelvis and noted some fibroids at that time. Now, CT scan isn't our favorite imaging for pelvic organs. We prefer to look with an ultrasound, so we'll often follow it up with that. But any of these forms of imaging can show fibroids in the uterus. So how about treatment? If you were found to have fibroids and you're either having no symptoms at all or maybe mild tolerable symptoms, do you have to do anything about it? The answer is no, you do not have to do anything about it. And most of the time we don't do anything about fibroids. Sometimes they're found incidentally when doing imaging for something else. Or if, uh, like I mentioned before, a CT scan was done and it happened to notice some fibroids. If it's not causing you a problem, you don't have to do anything about it. Like I mentioned, the risk of a fibroid being a cancerous condition is extremely rare. So we don't intervene on all fibroids just for the case of it being cancer because that's so unlikely. And then we would be inferring all of this risk to the patient by intervening, which may not be necessary if they're not having symptoms. So let's say you have fibroids and you are having symptoms and the symptom that you're experiencing is heavy bleeding. There are treatment options for this, ranging from medical options to surgical options. When it comes to bulk effect, meaning that the fibroids are quite large and are pressing on other things in the pelvis or in your abdomen or causing you pain, oftentimes medical treatments are less effective. There are some treatments that can slightly reduce the size of the fibroids and you can certainly try those and see if that helps and makes enough of a difference to spare you from evasive treatments. But a lot of the times really large bulk effect will be needed to be treated by something a little bit more invasive than just medical options. So this bulk effect that comes from the fibroids being on the outside of the uterus can vary based on where they're located and how big they are. The largest fibroid that I have removed surgically was 12 pounds. So a big bowling ball size, 12 pound fibroid, definitely causing a lot of symptoms, a lot of pain, back pain, pelvic pressure, and discomfort. Now that's on the much larger side. A lot of the ones that we see are smaller than that, but they can get really, really big. And that large size in the pelvis can cause a lot of symptoms and a lot of discomfort. So when it comes to deciding upon a treatment, there's no one recommended treatment depending on the symptoms you're having or depending on the location of the fibroids. This is very much a shared decision-making between you and your physician. So what are your, 
wants going forward. Are you done with childbearing or do you want to have more kids? Is your bleeding severe enough that you're becoming anemic? Have you tried some treatments before that haven't worked? Are you a poor surgical candidate or a good surgical candidate? There's so much that goes into the complex process of decision making when it comes to deciding upon a treatment plan. So it's very much individualized, very much includes you and your desires as a patient and what your physician might recommend based on your individual situation. So what are some medical treatment options for symptoms of fibroids? So usually we're using our medical treatment options for treatment of heavy bleeding associated with fibroids. So anything that we use for other causes of heavy bleeding are also options for fibroids. So this includes things like oral contraceptive pills, depo shots, Nexplanon, IUDs, all these things that we use to decrease menstrual bleeding, we can also try for fibroids. And these can be very effective. Again, a lot of it depends on the location of the fibroid and then the vast variety of response to all these treatments that's very individualized. So if bleeding is the main symptom you're having with fibroids, a medical treatment option like a birth control or contraception is a great place to start. We do have some other medications that are used for treatment that are not used for contraception. So these can be hormonal where they affect some of the hormonal changes and can put you in a state where your hormones are kind of shut down. This would be something like Lupron that puts you almost into like a state of menopause where there aren't the fluctuations so you don't get periods. And that can only be used for a short period of time, which is a little bit of a um, restricting factor, but it can also sometimes reduce the size of fibroids. You can also use a medicine called Orion, which is similar in that it changes those hormonal fluctuations, but is not a birth control. We also can use a medication called tranexamic acid. This is non-hormonal, but it works by reducing blood flow by affecting the way that your blood clots. So what surgical or intervention options are there for treating fibroids, either for bleeding or if they're causing mass or bulk effect? So the first one is something called a uterine artery embolization. And this is a procedure that's done by an interventional radiologist where they will go through vasculature in your groin and place an obstruction in the uterine arteries. So those are the main arteries that supply the blood supply to the uterus. This would then decrease the amount of blood supply to the fibroids and reduce the amount of bleeding that you can have and also hopefully cause the fibroid tissue to degenerate and hopefully kind of die and shrink off. Two other things you might hear of if you were to research this topic is something called a radiofrequency ablation and a magnetic resonance imaging guided ultrasound. So these are not really widely available. In fact, I've never actually seen them done or heard of any patients who told me they've had it done elsewhere. It's still, I wouldn't say theoretical, but and it's been studied and can be effective, but it's really not widely available to be used for patients, but you may see that if you look into this topic. So in terms of surgical interventions, another option is an endometrial ablation. This is a really fantastic procedure that we use for heavy bleeding. It may be effective for fibroids, kind of depends again on where the fibroids are located and how the response goes after having the procedure done, but it's minimally invasive and is an option. The other more common surgeries that you'll hear of are something called a myomectomy, which is a surgery done to just remove the fibroids from the uterus and a hysterectomy, which involves removing the uterus and and the fibroids with it. So the difference in whether you would do a myomectomy or a hysterectomy mainly depends on what your desires are for future childbearing. For the most part, if we were going to go in and do a myomectomy, if you didn't want any future babies, the increased risk and the increased morbidity and mortality, meaning chance of dying or chance of having complications, is similar between a myomectomy and a hysterectomy. So most of the time, if you don't want more kids and you want surgical intervention or considering a myomectomy, we would kind of consider consider just going ahead and doing a hysterectomy. The other benefit of hysterectomy is that the chance of needing to do additional surgery or do additional interventions is decreased compared to doing just a myomectomy. Now, with that being said, of course, this all can change based on what the situation is, but if you only have smaller fibroids or they're very pedunculated, meaning they're kind of hanging off of the uterus, or if you desire future childbearing, then a myomectomy is certainly a reasonable option. Now, additionally, myomectomy and hysterectomy, we've talked about doing more abdominal approaches. There's also the option of a hysteroscopic myomectomy. This would be for one of those submucosal fibroids. So this means the fibroids here on the inside of the uterus. A hysteroscopic myomectomy is when we approach this vaginally. So we go through the vagina, through the cervix with the camera and use instruments to remove the fibroids from the inside. This is really great for ones like this that are pedunculated or ones that are mostly out into the cavity as we can shave these off or completely remove 
move them hysteroscopically. A hysteroscopic approach is less invasive than abdominal approaches. So that is another means of removing the fibroids that can maintain fertility, leave your uterus in place, but can improve bleeding if bleeding is your main problem that you're having. Now, hysteroscopic, of course, would not be able to be used for subserosal fibroids because those are out on the outside of the uterus, not where the hysteroscope can see. So that's a general rundown on fibroids, the most common solid tumor diagnosed in women and very, very commonly seen in 70% of our females out there with a large array and variety of what you might experience symptoms-wise, some being completely asymptomatic, some causing severe bleeding, leading to anemia, some causing significant bulk symptoms from pressing on other organs in the abdomen. I hope you found this educational. If you'd like to look at any more videos or information about women's health, please check out my channel. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.